Hello, everybody. We will start the webinar shortly. We'll give, uh, give our participants a, a few seconds to get through the door. Uh, so everyone is with us when we begin. Just a few seconds more. Uh, we're very happy that you're all with us today. It is uh, similar to a, an in-person meeting in that not everybody can get through the door at the same time. So uh, we're giving people just another few seconds, another minute or so to, to get into the room and we will begin. I always picture it like a show's about about to start and they just open the doors and everybody's like filing in and grumbling about their seats and exactly. taking that last little opening their packages of M&Ms and you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the lights dim and everybody's still going <laughs> and then the sound begins and they stop grumbling and then it all calms down yep. <laughs> now that's a very pre-pandemic type association it is isn't it and hopefully it will be a post pandemic experience too. It has to before be. too long. We have to get back to live in life. That's such an important part of all of this. Yeah. Am I supposed to click this little got it button to get rid of that window? Maybe. I guess it won't hurt if I, oh, I just got everything lit up. Okay, there we go, perfect. Okay. We are ready to go. So welcome everybody. My name is Donna Magoon, and I am the chapter coordinator for the APDA Virginia chapter. Thank you so much for being with us today. I am pleased to welcome you to the first of a three-part educational webinar series. These webinars are designed for people with Parkinson's disease, as well as their care partners, family members, and healthcare providers. We are very grateful to Dr. Drew Falconer for volunteering his time today to present this topic, Until There's a Cure, Living Your Best Life with Parkinson's Disease. After some brief announcements, Dr. Falconer will make his presentation and then open things up to a Q&A session where you'll be able to ask questions about living your best life with Parkinson's disease. Just to tell you a little bit about who we are, the American Parkinson Disease Association Virginia chapter, or APDA for short, is part of the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease and to helping more than the 1 million people with PD across the United States live life to the fullest. The APDA Virginia chapter offers a variety of services to our constituents around the Commonwealth. You can visit our website to explore all that we have to offer. The website also hosts a wealth of information in publications, webinars, articles, research updates that can help you understand Parkinson's disease. If you are participating from another state, please know we have chapters and locations all around the US and you can find that contact information on our website as well. APDA Virginia is also available through our helpline, email and social media. One noteworthy achievement I do wanna mention and highlight as shown on this slide is that the APDA Virginia's support in the amount of $3.4 million for the PD research in our Commonwealth. Special thanks go out to Amneal Pharmaceuticals, the manufacturers, manufacturers of Raitari, and Kiawa Kirin, manufacturers of Nurians, for generously supporting this program and to acknowledge their appreciation for the critical need to provide programs like this 
during this time of uncertainty, we know you still have concerns about identifying ways to continue to live your best life with PD. Please visit their websites for more information about their products and services. Today, we are pleased to have Joe Simmons of M. Neal Pharmaceuticals with us, who will introduce Dr. Falconer. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much, Donna. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Drew Falconer, who is a board certified physician in neurology and is a fellowship trained movement disorder specialist. Dr. Falconer serves as director of the Inova Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center in Northern Virginia. Dr. Falconer became interested in neurology and movement disorders after seeing the impact that quality, compassionate care combined with cutting edge pharmacology and technology could have on a patient's condition. His goal is to work as a team with his patients to restore the quality of life they deserve. I actually have had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Falconer for several years. He's been to Virginia Beach before, speaking to an active patient support group here. He's also taken part in several meetings of my company, Amnio Pharmaceuticals, teaching representatives like me about the finer points of Parkinson's disease and how it can be managed so that patients can live their very best lives. So without further ado, I will happily turn the program over to Dr. Drew Falconer. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Donna. Thank you, APDA, for bringing us together today. Um, that was a fantastic introduction and humbles me um, because it is always, you know, you get so busy doing this every day, you forget about all that's been done. And I think it's really a moment with the year coming to an end uh, that we all need to give ourselves a giant pat on the back. This is 2021 has been a little different than 2020, and I feel like we all need that collective sigh of relief that we're really doing the best we can. And so I want to try to build on that idea of doing better and doing the best we can um, by spending a little time with you today talking about Parkinson's disease, obviously, but really from this perspective of what is Parkinson's and how do we think about this condition now in 2021, which is very different than how we thought about it 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's just that's not just a change in approach about how we think about Parkinson's, but it's mainly a change in approach about how we treat it. And I think it's no big secret that there really is a gulf about a mile wide between how folks do on modern medicines versus not so modern medicines. And the unfortunate truth is that, according to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, 80% of patients are only maintained on classic carvedopa levodopa. Classic carvedopa levodopa that was first released into the market in 1972 and has not changed since that time. And that's not to say, as we'll talk about today, that levodopa isn't amazing, because it is. But if we have tools to do something, we always need to know the limitations of those tools so that when those limitations are making themselves apparent, we can then move to better tools. And in doing this a lot, I find that that's really the gap. The gap is in education, the gap is in knowledge, and the gap is in just an understanding about how the symptoms that are holding you back every day are really a medication problem and not necessarily a Parkinson's one. And so I hope through today we'll get to that point where you understand what I'm talking about and you can then take that knowledge and use it to build the conversation you have with your doctor the next time you meet. Because at the end of the day, we need you to have a good relationship with a good doc who communicates, but you have to have the courage to be a self-advocate. You have to have the courage to go into that visit and tell that doctor how your day is going. Tell that doctor the things you wish you could do that you can't. Tell that doctor how the medicines are letting you down and your symptoms are coming out, and then work together to find a plan on how to fix it. Because I can promise you this, and I do this a fair amount. We were just talking about how I've probably seen about 100 Parkinson's patients this week. We are never at a point where there's not another option. We are never in the cul-de-sac where you can't get out. We are never in the dark alleyway where there's no way to go from here. It is never an instance of this is as good as it gets, good luck. If anyone tells you that, I'm here to tell you it's not true. There are things we can do. There are treatments we can use. As of today, there are 23 medications that we use to treat Parkinson's disease. 12 of them 
did not exist five years ago. So the point is, we need to have you have a good relationship with someone, but to have the courage to talk to that someone about how your day is going, the cadence of your day, and how your medicines are letting you down. Essentially, we want you to talk about why you can't do what you want to do. So then we can come up with a good plan to use a better tool to make that a thing of the past. And I think to do that, we're really going to go through four different topics today, and then we'll answer, open the floor to some questions, which will be fun. But I think first, we really need to lay the groundwork. We need to reset that foundational knowledge of what is this Parkinson's thing? How do I think about Parkinson's disease every day? When I see somebody, what, is, what, what am I thinking about? And I'll give you that, and hopefully that will let you build from there into the basics of treatment because it's very important to know what you're on. It's very important to know the limitations of what you're on so that if we have some issues, we know where to go to fix it. And then we're gonna spend some time going through all the new medicines of the last five or six years. We'll go one at a time. I'll give you the high, the thousand foot view of these new agents so that if you see them, you'll know them. And I'll tell you where we place them in our treatment paradigm for Parkinson's. And then of course, to the future, it is always a very hopeful thing because every year we're getting two, three, four new medications that all work better. We're getting better technology. It is really a renaissance in the world of Parkinson's in terms of how we treat it, including talk about disease modifying therapies and a cure. But before we do that, let's set the ground groundwork, right? You have to build the foundation before you build the house. <clears throat> so it is important to know that you are not alone. Parkinson's disease is the second fastest growing neurologic condition we have. We are currently treating a million people in the US for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and it's estimated that by 2030, we'll be treating 1.2 to 1.5 million people in the US with Parkinson's. In fact, folks over the age of 60, one in 100 people have it, and we're diagnosing between 60 and 80,000 people every year with Parkinson's. Now, it's not supposed to be a scary number. It's not supposed to overwhelm you. It's really supposed to just let you know that you're not alone. This is a condition that affects many people. You are seeing it more. You are not making that up. And so that gives a common purpose to all of us working in the space of Parkinson's, all of us who are living with Parkinson's, that we have to educate. We have to be a community. We have to build each other up because there are better paths than probably the thing you're taking. Because at the end of the day, we overcomplicate Parkinson's. And yes, we overcomplicate it because it is a complicated condition. It does affect everything in your body from the tip of your hair to the tip of your shoe, right? If you pick a system of the body and you slow it down, that's a symptom of Parkinson's. But remember, Parkinson's disease is not a structural problem. This is not a condition that comes from a tumor, from a mass, from a stroke. This Parkinson's disease does not represent permanence of injury. I mean, if you have a stroke, people will tell you that part of the brain is damaged. It's unfortunately gone. The brain has to modulate around it. That's permanence, right? With Parkinson's disease, if you do an MRI of the brain, a CAT scan of the brain, a structural scan of the brain, it should, for all intents and purposes, be normal because the structures of the brain aren't the problem. Parkinson's is just a chemical deficiency. It's just a chemical problem. I tell patients all the time that with Parkinson's disease, you are like a car that's driving around with an empty tank of gas, and it's our job to fill that tank all the time to make you better. And the gas in that analogy is dopamine. Don't overthink this. Parkinson's disease is just a deficiency of dopamine. Like we see in the picture here, we have a normal neuron where dopamine is flowing in between. We got a lot of it. But with Parkinson's, we have a reduced, oh, uh, it, um, yes. Uh, we have a reduced level of dopamine. And so it's like the tank becomes empty. Um, hold on one second. Janice, can you close my door? I'm... No, I'm on a national webinar, so I got to go. Can, can you close the door, please? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, guys. Um, so with a dopamine deficiency like Parkinson's disease, um, that's all we're dealing with. And so it's like the tank is empty. When the light comes on, that's when the symptoms come out. 
So if we're dealing with a chemical problem and that's it, then during the day at any one point, the tank is either low or not giving you the dopamine you need and the symptoms come out. The tank is overfilled and we get side effects like dyskinesia, that excessive movement that we always think about with Parkinson's, which remember, dyskinesia is a side effect of our medicine. It's not a symptom of Parkinson's. Or at any point during the day, we've got the tank full and you're good. And so what I want you to do is if Parkinson's ever becomes overwhelming, if it ever becomes complicated, if it ever seems like it's just too much, then what I want you to do is do what I do all every day. And that is take a deep breath. First off, realize you're gonna be okay. The life expectancy with and without Parkinson's is exactly the same nowadays because we can treat it better. And if you seem overwhelmed or if it seems too much, think about it just as a chemical problem. And if it's a chemical problem, then we just need to fix that chemical problem in a better way, in a smoother, more predictable way to see ourselves out of the woods. And people always ask, where does it come from? Well, remember, Parkinson's is not, a, not an inherited condition. And it does tend to have a genetic component. There is something in the genome, there's something in the genetics that predisposes a person to Parkinson's, but it's classically not something that runs in families. And it tends to be the intersection between that genetic predisposition and something environmental that triggers it to be positive. But at the end of the day, all Parkinson's is, is that deficiency of dopamine becomes symptomatic. Now, diagnosis is extremely important. It's very important to make sure you have Parkinson's, to make sure that we're treating the thing we got. And the reason why I say that is that we have, we as a Parkinson's center see all hosts of patients, and I still can't tell you how frequent it is that we get a patient who's misdiagnosed. They were told they have a central tremor, but it's very obviously Parkinson's disease, or they were told they have Parkinson's disease, and it's not. What I want you to do is make sure the shoe fits. Now, in a classic sense, so for most people out there, we diagnose Parkinson's disease by taking the symptoms and the history, make, getting the history and how you present, and then in a good exam to show some Parkinsonian symptoms. And then for most people, we give you medication to show benefit. It's called a dopamine challenge, and that's how most people diagnose Parkinson's. The reason why it makes sense if you think about it, Parkinson's is a chemical deficiency. If the symptoms are coming from the tank being low and we give you the medicine to fill the tank back up, all of a sudden the symptoms should get better, right? But sometimes life doesn't work that way. Sometimes symptoms don't respond the way you think. Sometimes it's not as easy as black and white. And so we do have a scan that we can use that I always like to tell folks about. It's called a DAT scan, D-A-T. It stands for Dopamine Active Transporter. It's a scan that's been around in the US since about 2010. It is FDA approved for the diagnosis of Parkinson's and covered for, by most insurers. We tend to write a fair amount of DAT scans through our clinic because it gives us the ability in color to see if you have Parkinson's. It gives us a yes or no answer in color that says, yes, you have Parkinson's disease. And it also gives us a, a, a bit of a degree of how bad. And in fact, this picture on the right is a DAT scan. And you can see on the left side is what we would consider a normal person who has these two bright comma shapes. They're, called, they're part of the brain called the putamen. And in Parkinson's, it goes away. You can see they slowly go away. And so it's a great scan if the shoe doesn't neatly fit. It's a great scan if there's gray area, because it's really important to know what we're treating to make sure we're doing it right. And I always lean on the fact that there was a pretty big study that came out in 2014 that followed patients from diagnosis till they're passing to autopsy. And in fact, about 15% of the time, even a fellowship trained specialist like me can be wrong. So I always question the diagnosis if its shoe doesn't neatly fit. Because at the end of the day, there are a lot of things that mimic Parkinson's disease. And the key differentiator between true Parkinson's disease and what people call Parkinsonisms, which is a very generic term and actually doesn't help because ism just means like. And so a Parkinsonism is a Parkinson's like condition, which doesn't mean anything. But the difference is with Parkinson's disease, you give medicine and they get better. Parkinsonism, you give medicine and they don't. 
So there are a number of different mimickers of Parkinson's out there, including what we call vascular Parkinson's disease, where you can get little strokes that occur in the brain that block that pathway for Parkinson's and cause the symptoms of Parkinson's without having a deficiency of dopamine. We have what we call medication-induced Parkinson's, where you can take medicine that, not Parkinson's medicines, that work to, by blocking dopamine in the brain. And by blocking dopamine, you get similar symptoms as if you're not making it. And also some of these Parkinson's plus syndromes, like multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, and corticobasal degeneration, which the common theme of all of these conditions is that they look like Parkinson's, but you don't respond to medication. It's a Parkinsonism. But it's really important to know what you got, because until we know what you got, we can't come up with a good plan about what to expect or what to do about it. Now, I wanted to bring up this slide for a couple of reasons. Let me see here. Where's my meeting controls? There we go. Oh, I can't annotate. There it is. Annotate. There we go. Okay. So I want to orient you to this graph to begin with. So this is supposed to represent how Parkinson's changes over the years. And I'll, or I'll bring, draw your eye to the middle here where time is zero. And the time at zero is actually diagnosis. So this is the time when you see a doctor and the doctor says, yes, you have Parkinson's disease. But what I want you to notice is that Parkinson's actually starts many, many years before diagnosis. Some people say 10 or even 20 years before diagnosis, we start to see symptoms. And if you think about it as a chemical problem, it makes sense. It takes the brain being deficient in dopamine by about 60% to show symptoms, motor symptoms, tremor, dexterity, walking. But when that tank is 10% down or 20% down or 30% down, we do see symptoms. And classically, it's the triad of constipation, problems going to the bathroom, a REM behavioral sleep disorder, talking and acting out in your dreams, and a reduced or absent sense of smell. And usually at that first visit, we ask folks that, and it'll be, oh, you know, how's your sense of smell? And the spouse laughs and says, oh, he hadn't been able to smell anything for 10, 20 years. And then the husband will say, oh, well, I painted houses, so I always blamed it on that. This was a patient I saw yesterday. And then you'd say, okay, well, are you, um, How's your sleep at night? And again, the spouse laughs and says, well, my husband acts out his dreams. He kicks and moves in his sleep. He calls out in his sleep. And I usually make a joke about if he tells you where the gold is buried, I should get a portion because I'm telling you to listen for it. That's the rim behavioral sleep disorder. And then I ask about constipation. And again, they joke that the plumber's name is on speed dial because the constipation can be so bad. It's that triad of constipation, sleep changes, and reduced sense of smell that tend to predate a diagnosis of Parkinson's. But the thing to remember is that if that's 20 years worth of progression, well then the following 20 years of progression should be equally slow. So as that deficiency is going from 60% down to 70 to 80, it's going at what should be a semi-glacial pace. Parkinson's progresses very slowly. And so what that means is that we need to not save medications. We need to treat you the best we can for today. And then we just have to have a relationship and the ability to be flexible and adapt as things change over time. Because all it's changing over time is that, that number one, you're getting older. If the average age of onset of Parkinson's is 65, then 10 years into your diagnosis, you're 75, 20, you're 85. So we're fighting against that tide of age but we're also fighting against the fact that that deficiency is getting worse and you're simply becoming more reliant on us to give you dopamine back, which we can do in beautiful ways now in 2020, almost 2022. But at the end of the day, we need to find a better way to communicate about Parkinson's. And this goes to my overarching theme of having the courage to talk about it I need you to feel confident that you can go into your doctor's office and have a good conversation about your Parkinson's. And so what does that take? Because that's, I mean, if you get nothing else out of this, I want you to be able to communicate with your doc a little better. So what it takes is it takes knowing what you're feeling. Now hear me through on that because that's a very nebulous term, right? Part of your day 
is trying to maintain the amount of dopamine in your brain you need, right? That's the medicine. It's in there trying to keep things good. But there are times during your day, most likely, when the medicines are letting you down and symptoms are coming out. Now, in the world of Parkinson's, we call that off time. The idea being that when medicines are working, when your symptoms are good, we could call that on time where you feel good. If there's a time when the medicines are letting you down and your symptoms are coming out, that's what we call off time. And so what I suggest is you actually talk to your doctor about off time, because at the end of the day, the off time is the time when you're symptomatic. That's the enemy of Parkinson's. Then if we come up with a plan to address it, we would have fixed your Parkinson's disease. And off time can be in many different forms. It can be at many different times. I have patients who it's the easy one where tremor comes out or their walking changes and becomes slower when the next dose of medicine is due. I have patients who, who feel that when they start wearing off, they get a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of depression, they get a little antsy, they just need to go sit down. I have some patients who start to break out in sweats, they feel very tired, they feel dizzy. Uh, some people wake up in the morning and they feel especially tight and slow, the idea of first AM or morning akinesia. Or some patients will take a dose of medicine, feel like it doesn't work all that well, and it wears off suddenly. Well, guess what? As, and that's what this graph in the middle is showing us, as you take and need more levodopa during the day, people have a greater percentage of off time. Don't overthink it. Parkinson's is a chemical problem. It's a deficiency of dopamine. The amount of levodopa you need to fix that chemical problem is proportionate to the deficiency. The more levodopa you need, the greater your deficiency. The more levodopa you need, the more reliant you are on us to give you that dopamine back. So the more you need, the more you fluctuate. But here's what I want you to remember, and we'll say this a few more times during this talk. The fluctuations that you feel during the day, that wearing off, that feeling good, then feeling less, feeling good, then feeling less, that's not truly a Parkinson's problem. I, I get that it is, but hear me through. Carvedopa levodopa, the foundational medicine of most people's Parkinson's disease, their management, right? It's the basis. It's a medicine that dates back to 1972. And as we'll talk about in a minute, it is not smooth. And a healthy volunteer, when you take that chalky yellow tablet, it shoots up into their system, hits its peak after about 60 or 90 minutes, and then drops like a stone at about three to four hours. Well, guess what? If your system is reliant on us to give you dopamine back, if you've gone from a type two diabetic who we can boost your natural insulin to make you better, and now you're a type one where we just need to give you insulin, get it, dopamine and insulin, and you're taking a medicine that goes up and down in your system all day, and your day is feeling better, feeling worse, feeling better, feeling worse, then those fluctuations are a medicine problem, not a Parkinson's problem. Because at the end of the day, if I tell you it's a Parkinson's problem, it's one of those great, you know, good luck kind of things, which I hate. If we say it's a medicine problem, which it is, then all of a sudden the world opens up on opportunities and better therapies, better tools that we can use to smooth it out. Because off time happens, guys. Off time's the enemy. Off time is the thing we want to go away. There's a pretty big survey from the Michael J. Fox Foundation of 3,000 patients with Parkinson's who were given a long list of off time symptoms and asked if they had off time. 70% of those patients had at least two episodes of off time during the day. 65% had at least two hours a day when they were off and their symptoms were coming out. And half of the patients actually adjusted what they chose to do every day because of their off time. That is unacceptable, that's, un that's immoral. We need to treat Parkinson's better so that people aren't choosing not to do things because of their Parkinson's. They're out there doing what they want despite their Parkinson's disease because we treated it better. And I promise you the tools exist for us to do it. So that brings us to this. I mentioned it a minute ago. What I'd like to do is show you first this graph on the right, which is a, it's actually from a study from 1974 on the plasma concentration of original carvedopa levodopa, the chalky little yellow tablet, 25100. What you can see is exactly what I mentioned a minute ago. When you take that medicine, it shoots up like a rocket, hits its peak after about 90 minutes, and then drops like a stone 
over about three to four hours. And yes, early on in Parkinson's disease, folks can do that. Take levodopa three times a day and it lasts, it works. Because early on, you have a good buffering capacity, a good ability to hold on to it. And you're also producing a lot of natural dopamine, which is kind of filling in the tank. And that's what this graph on the right showing us is that, but in the window, the difference between enough medicine to fill the tank and not overdoing it and causing side effects. Early in Parkinson's, you can fluctuate and you stay in between these two lines because the window is pretty big and you're younger, you're earlier in Parkinson's. But all that's happening as Parkinson's progresses, as you go from year two to year five to year 10, is that this window is starting to narrow. And so all of a sudden, you feel these fluctuations. When the medicine hits its peak, you might get some dyskinesia or symptoms of too much. And then when you hit a valley, you have off time. If the enemy is off time and we want to try to do away with the lows and the highs, then we need to do with Parkinson's what we've done with diabetes, which is give you medicine in the smoothest, most predictable, most consistent way. And surprise, people can't help but get better. So that takes us to the world of treatment. Because at the end of the day, if you look across the landscape of people who treat Parkinson's disease, well, first off, only about 28% of people with Parkinson's will see a specialist like me. It's really a sad number and we keep doing everything we can to help that. But most people with Parkinson's are treated by general neurology or even internal medicine docs who don't have the understanding and specialty training that us specialists do. But I promise you they're doing the best they can with what they have. Now you'll find that even in a specialist level, we tend to split into two different camps. The one camp are those folks we call the classic treatment paradigm folks, who their approach is carvedopa levodopa works great. It's the only medicine we need. It's been the gold standard since 1972, which tells you something. Um, if you're fluctuating, just take more of it. Take more of it, take it frequently. If it's not enough, take more. And what that causes is fluctuations. The medicine is fluctuating, not the disease. And after about five or six years, people tend to feel worse. So that's where that old idea that Parkinson's gets worse after five or six years, or, or the greatest old wives tale of the bunch, which is that the medicine only lasts for five or six years. I promise you, levodopa never stops working. There is no five or six year window of when it works. But if it only works in your system for two to three hours, it may be four, then after five or six years, when people feel it's stop working, all they're doing is feeling what the medicine is doing at, at the best it can. And so this classic approach really leads to, leads to a lot of motor fluctuations, early side effects, and a treatment horizon. But our current approach, the way this more contemporary approach, is that we have 23 different tools that we can use to try to smooth things out. 23 different medicines that we can use to give dopamine back to you in the smoothest, more predictable, more, more contemporary way. And they attack through multiple different targets. So if we have five different categories of medicines that stabilize dopamine, why just use one? They're all complementary. They all help each other work better. So we, in this modern approach, do something called rational polypharmacy. The idea being that we can use different medicines that approach different targets together and it works better. And we tend to use technology a whole lot earlier too. We do a fair amount of dopamine, of DBS, deep brain stimulation. We use dual pump. We do all these kind of fun things that smooth things out to make it better. And what have we found? We found that this approach is a whole lot smoother. I mean, I haven't seen dyskinesia in my clinic maybe once or twice in the past two months. The side effects, is, side effects are measurably reduced because things are smoother and it's evergreen. I mean, with the classic approach, we quote to patients five to six years before they feel the fluctuations. With our modern approach, we can keep people in a good place for 20, even 30 years. And that's what modern medications do. I mean, at the end of the day, think about it. If the best we could do was 1972, I kind of give up. So before we jump into the modern medicines, I do want to walk you through the four main categories of medicines that most people are treated with, because it's important to know the tool you're using, what it does, and also the limitation of it, because then you'll realize if your fluctuations are due to that, and that would be a great time to talk to your doctor about other options. So to do that, we're gonna teach off of this graphic, 
which is a picture of like from earlier, the, the, ner the um, space between neurons, the synapse, and these little blue dots are dopamine. And with Parkinson's, we have less. So we wanna fill this bathtub up with as much dopamine as we can. And as we've talked about a couple of times, the old guard, original gold standard, the foundational therapy for most people with Parkinson's is the medicine levodopa. Now, if you don't know it, levodopa works because when it goes into the brain, the brain takes off the levo group and what's left is dopa. Dopa is dopamine. It's very much like giving a diabetic insulin. It gives your brain dopamine back. The problem was in the 1950s when we discovered this, and we gave a whole bunch of people IV levodopa, which levodopa by itself has a half-life of about 60 minutes, only an hour. We found that most people would become profusely nauseated, vomit, and pass out. Never a good thing. So that's why, starting in 1969 and released in 1972, every version of levodopa has carvedopa with it. That's why Cinemet is Carvedopa Levodopa. That's why Ritari is Carvedopa Levodopa. That's why Stilevo is Carvedopa Levodopa and Tacopone. They all have Carvedopa with it because Carvedopa keeps Levodopa from giving you side effects like nausea and vomiting. So it's important to remember that because Levodopa in all of those versions is the active medicine. It's the medicine that's making you better. So in the 25100 tablet, it's the 100 milligrams of Levodopa that we care about. In fact, that's why the old trade name was Cinemet, because it was supposed to be cute. It was supposed to be Latin for senimesis or don't vomit, because when you added carvedopa to levodopa, you stopped vomiting, senimet. But the limitation of classic carvedopa levodopa is that it is very, very sensitive to a lot of things. In a healthy volunteer, if you take a tablet of Cinemet, only about 5% of it makes it to the brain. If you're constipated, if you take it with food, if you take it and have slow gastric motility, if you're stressed, if you name it, that 5% that gets there starts to shrink. And the stuff that gets to the brain, like we showed a minute ago, goes up and comes down over about three to four hours. So if you find that you're only on Cinemet, classic Carvedopa Levodopa, and you get three to four hours of benefit and it's up and down, that's everyone, there are ways to do better. Everything we've invented since 1972 has been to try to fix that. One way is by a medicine called a COMPT inhibitor, COMT. The older one was in tacopone. The newer one, as we'll talk about in a minute, is a medicine called Ongentis. I tend to view COMPT inhibitors sort of like Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man, the little yellow guy who would eat up all the little dots and the ghosts would chase after him? Well, a COMPT inhibitor is like Pac-Man if the little dots are levodopa. So when you take Cinemet, Carvedopa Levodopa, and it's flowing through your bloodstream trying to get to the brain, the comp system is breaking it down. It is Pac-Man eating it up as it's trying to get to the target. And the problem is when it breaks down Levodopa, the thing it digests it into also then competes with Levodopa to get to the brain. So we've known for a long time that having an active comp system inhibits our Levodopa from working. So starting in the 90s, we had a medicine called Intacapone, which they added to Carvedopa Levodopa in a medicine called Stilevo to stay the Levodopa, where we blocked the comp system. And by blocking the comp system, it gave Levodopa a boost. The challenge is, original Intacapone, as we'll talk about in a minute, only lasts for about two hours. So you have to take it with every single dose of Carvedopa Levodopa. It essentially takes a roller coaster and makes it bigger. So we've moved away from using Intacapone a couple of years ago because we have much better, smoother medicines. Another category are the dopamine agonist. We have three of them available. The original one is Ropinarol. The newer one is Pramapexol. And the newest is actually a patch, a medicine called Nupro. Now, dopamine agonists don't give dopamine back. They just agonize the receptors. They pretend to be dopamine. It's this idea that if dopamine is supposed to go and flip a switch, the agonists just go and flip that switch. And the nice part about our three dopamine agonists is that they all come in a once daily form. Primapexol ER, Ropinarol ER, and the patch, as long as it's on, is working. They're a great medicine to add on to things because they can give 24 hours of coverage. They can help with overnight wearing off, morning akinesia. They help smooth things out. 
And also if we have patients who are very young, who are newly diagnosed, we might just start with a once daily dopamine agonist because there's nothing easier than once a day. Uh, as you get older, as you get into your mid seventies or 80, we tend to back away from dopamine agonists. The side effect risk goes up. Now the final category are the MAOB inhibitors. So these are not MAO inhibitors. There's old antidepressants like phenylzine that are MA, general MAO inhibitors and they have terrible side effect profiles, such things as not being able to drink wine, red wine or eat cheese, which to my mother means she, was get, she would give up. That does not apply to MAOB inhibitors. MAOB inhibitors are specific to the brain. That's what the B stands for. They are, selegiline was the original one, the newer one is risagiline or azelect, and the newest is zadago or cefenamide. These are medicines that go into the brain and they don't add dopamine, they just block its breakdown. If you picture the brain like a bathtub, an MAOB inhibitor clogs up the drain and lets the medicines we give and the natural dopamine stick around longer. They're also nice because risagiline and zadago are once daily. Are you catching on to the theme here? Once a day, smooth, predictable is better. Well, those are once daily medicines that allow all of our other medicines to work better. Now, if you look at this though, the, um, all of these medicines work differently. They either give the precursor to make dopamine like levodopa, they block the thing that inhibits levodopa like Comptan, a Compton inhibitor, they pretend to be dopamine or they block its breakdown. This is why it makes sense to use combinations of medicines that work as a team to try to stabilize things over time, because they're all different. They're all designed to be worked to get to work together. So as of eight years ago, this was our toolbox. This was the collection of medicines, the tools that we had to try to fix the deficiency of dopamine in Parkinson's. And in fact, I put Artane or trihexafenadil over here in the corner. Yes, I put baby in the corner, which is a dirty dancing joke that I made to a bunch of students and they had no idea what I was talking about. It was very sad. Um, but I put Artane over here, trihexafenadil, because some people still use it for Parkinson's. I would strongly caution everyone on this call to not use trihexafenadil or Artane for Parkinson's disease. It is a medicine from 1945. It was how we treated Parkinson's before levodopa. And it has a whole host of problems and side effects, including memory problems and in, in the pseudo dementia, which is why we don't touch our team. Okay, so now we're gonna change gears. Hope everybody's doing okay. We're collecting a little bit of questions too, which is great. I'm gonna take a sip of water and we are going to change gears and start talking about the modern medications we have, these tools that have come out in the last six years or so, where we think about them, how we think about them. And I really hope you, you take from this, not necessarily if there's gonna be a quiz later, cause there's not, but just to be aware that these medicines exist. And if it sounds like one of them could help, it's a great time to bring that up with your doctor the next time you meet. Ah, water helps. It's been a long week. So let's start with the foundation. If the foundation of your therapy is levodopa, as it is for most Parkinson's patients, and that's rightfully so, because levodopa is dopamine, and this is a dopamine problem, right? And if the problem is that levodopa doesn't last very long, well, then it might be worth considering a medicine called Ritari. So Ritari is carvodopa and levodopa. It's the same medicine that was in that classic chalk yellow tablet that people use, but it was updated, not in the chemical, but in the delivery system. The idea behind Ritari was to try to find a way to give levodopa more consistently over time. And so what they did was they took levodopa and put it into a capsule with about 150 little beads in it. And all the beads are different time-released carvodopa levodopa. You take it, it opens up in the stomach, the beads spread out, get caught in all the little folds of the small intestines, and you get a boost of medicine right away, approximately hour two and hour four. And so what it does is if you take a dose of Cinemat, original Cinemat, and you compare it to the same dose of Ritari, Ritari gives people on average 1.2 more hours of on time from that same dose. And if you look at it in this respect, I know this is a little complicated, but I want to walk you through it. It explains why. So if you look at first this lime green line, 
The lime green line represents immediate release carvedopa levodopa, original cinemet, which just like we've talked about a hundred times, shoots up like a rocket and then drops like a stone over about three to four hours. Well, remember with Parkinson's disease, we're trying to fill your tank up. So we need to get you up at this level where your tank is full all the time. Well, in 1992, they created Cinemet CR, which is the old immediate, the old continuous release, which is a really challenging drug. I do not recommend that people take it during the day because all they did to make CR was they took immediate release carvedopa levodopa, the chalky yellow tablet, ground it up and put it into a little wax matrix. It's just medical wax. And as your body eats away at the medical wax, it leaches out the old medicine. So it really is almost the definition of poorly predictable and poorly consistent. And in fact, if you average people's concentration of levodopa in their blood with CR, it's really hard. It kind of looks like this. It's a little more delayed for on, and it's slow, but it still doesn't last very long. People who take Cinemet CR during the day tend to fluctuate a lot. They tend to have random periods of dyskinesia, of sweating, of wearing on, wearing off, because their body is not consistently getting what they need. And so then in 1992, we came out with Carvedopa Levodopa in Tacopone, which was Stilevo, like we talked about a minute ago, the COMP inhibitor. And it shoots up a little bit higher, but still drops like a stone over about three to four hours. The problem was all of these other versions of Carvedopa Levodopa, original, CR, and in a COMPT inhibitor, all were based on the original tablet of Carvedopa Levodopa. Well, the purple is what Ritari does. You get the same peak, it flattens out, and it keeps you up for a good five or six hours and then it tapers slowly over time instead of dropping like a stone. I tell folks that they can expect a good four to five hours out of Ritari, which is still better than three. It spaces out their doses. They have a lot more flexibility. We tend to start by going to Ritari in a lot of cases because if the foundational medicine is the problem, this is a way to try to at least help that. And if Ritari still causes fluctuations, we then build on top of that with complementary medicines. One of them is Norians, which is a medicine that came out about two years ago. Well, Norians is interesting because it's, well, it's been in Japan for about 10 years. So the, the Japanese physicians love it because it approaches Parkinson's disease differently. So there are two main pathways that we know of that cause the movement problems in Parkinson's. There's the direct pathway, which is dopamine. And then there's this other pathway called the indirect pathway. Well, the indirect pathway doesn't run on dopamine. It runs on a different hormone called adenosine. And it's kind of the opposite of dopamine. In Parkinson's disease, it's like a seesaw. Do dopamine starts to go down and adenosine starts to go up. And so we tend to view it like the gas and the brake. That by, by, it's like driving a car, right? If you're pushing on the gas and your dopamine starts to go away, you take your foot off the gas, the car slows down. Well, adenosine actually slows movement. So the more adenosine you got, the more we're pushing on the brake. And so it makes sense with Parkinson's, if you're still having movement problems, if you're still having problems with mobility and with consistent symptom response, to try adding Norians to the equation because Norians works by inhibiting the inhibitor. It takes the foot off the brake to allow us to push on the gas better with dopamine. We actually have pictures that show that. That's, this is a, the opposite of a DAT scan. This is an adenosine receptor scan that shows that with Parkinson's disease, the adenosine receptors actually go up. It gets darker. I mean, it gets brighter. It's red and yellow. And so if you're, if you're fluctuating during the day, adenosine is a good thing to try in a non-dopamine way to try to help things. Nice thing too is that it has a half-life of about 80 hours. So it tends to work for a really long time to kind of smooth things out. But because its half-life is so long, it takes a little bit of time to build up in people's systems. Now, remember earlier we talked about COMPT inhibitors, the, the idea that there's a system of the body that's designed to eat up levodopa to keep it from going to the brain. And we talked about how in tacopone, the original one, Stilevo and tacopone, COMPTAN, didn't last for very long. Well, we have a new medicine called Ongentis. That's a once daily COMPT inhibitor. It's been in Europe since 2016. It's once daily, again, smooth, predictable, once daily, that is very efficient at blocking the COMPT system. 
And in fact, this picture on the right kind of compares the three. So it's a little busy, but here, if you look on the up and down axis, this is the activity of the comp system. We want it to go away, right? So we want it to be here by zero. And then time. Well, the little squares are placebo. They don't do anything, it's placebo. So they stick around 100% activity. Well, look, this is still, this is intacapone. Intacapone gives about a 50% block for little short periods of time. That's why we don't like intacapone all that much. It's not consistent. It's fluctuating. It's part of the problem. Ongentis gives us a way, that's the dots at the bottom, to block this system very smoothly and predictably for 24 hours. I tell you guys, it works really well, especially you add this to Ritari and it works gangbuster. It really does just give us the ability to allow our levodopa to work to its potential. The big side effect is dyskinesia, right? Dyskinesia is a symptom of too much. This is a booster. I tell folks all the time, if we do something or add something and dyskinesia occurs, it's actually kind of a good thing. It means the medicines are working. We can then back off on your levodopa, bring that curve down because you probably don't need as much, right? So it's all about trying. It's all about adapting. It's all about sticking with as much once daily, smooth, consistent as you can, and then having the courage to talk about it, to, to work, to keep tuning. Now, if you have dyskinesia, symptoms of too much, you still, for the most part, also have symptoms of not enough. That's that swing, right? You get the peaks and then the valleys. There's a great medicine available called Gocovery, which is, again, once daily, you take it at bedtime, like another once daily medicine that is FDA approved for both symptoms of dyskinesia and symptoms of not enough for too high and too little. It's the only medicine we got that's designed for both. Because if you think about it, if you're fluctuating in the old classic paradigm, if you don't want off time, you just take more and you get more dyskinesia. If you don't want as much dyskinesia, you take less and you get more off time. It's really, you're, you're kind of in a bind there. Recovery is a great medicine to add to kind of break that bind. Because with one pill at bedtime or two pills, you treat the dyskinesia and you fill in the potholes during the day. Now we have three medicines available also that are what we call as needed medicines for Parkinson's. They're as needed. Now this concept is completely new to us relatively and it takes thinking about your Parkinson's differently. What I mean by that is that we have trained our patients. We, we talk about it all the time about regimenting your medicines, regimenting when you take them, sticking to the routine. This category of medicines are for the what happens in between. These are medicines that are designed to be taken by you when you feel like you need them. It is such an empowering, empowering category of medicines. You can take them up to five times a day. You don't have to take them at all. But they, these medicines are for those times when you have an off period and your next medicine's not due and you don't know what to do. These are the medicines for you're going out to go do Zumba class and you're walking in feeling a little bit Parkinsonian. You can use one of these medicines to prime the pump before you exercise. Or if you're going out somewhere and you go from walking to I can't, you can do this to fill the tank up, to fill the pothole when it occurs. The original one was Apican. It's an injectable. It's a little dial up injector that you give yourself a shot. And within 10 minutes, you go from being off to being on. The second is a medicine called Imbresia which is an inhaler. It's an inhaled version of levodopa. So if the foundation of your day is carbidopa levodopa, this is the fix a crack for when there's a crack in that foundation of the same medicine. Because it's an inhaler, it works by absorbing through the lungs. It works a lot faster. You don't need carbidopa. You don't need carbidopa and the dose is a lot less. And within 10 minutes, people tend to achieve on and feel better. And then the newest is a medicine called Kinmobi. Kenmobi is a strip made on the same technology as those Listerine breath strips that you actually put under your tongue. It dissolves. And within 10 or 15 minutes, it takes you from being off to being on. All three of these are indicated up to three times or up to five times a day for off periods. I have a whole lot of patients who will use one of these when they first wake up in the morning and they feel off. They take their Ritari or their Levodopa and they use Kenmobi and boom, within 10 minutes, they're up feeling great while their levodopa is kicking in. I have patients who use these once a day, three times a day, once a week. These are the, you get to pick when you use them to fix the symptoms when you feel them.
It's an incredibly empowering category of medicines and should be used more. Okay, another medicine is a medicine called Northera. So one, of, one symptom that comes along with Parkinson's sometimes is something called orthostatic hypotension. It's the idea that when you stand up, your blood pressure drops, and when it drops, you can become lightheaded, dizzy, or fall. The medicines we give for Parkinson's can actually make that worse. Well, Northera is a medicine that is now generic, so it's a lot easier to get. That's actually designed to fix the problem in Parkinson's that causes that. It works extremely well to fix dizziness, drops in blood pressure, and stabilize things over time. And I also wanted to bring up Nuplazid because one of the unfortunate things that can occur with Parkinson's is the development of hallucinations, delusions, and psychosis. And if that happens classically, we would use medicines like quetiapine or Seroquel, or even in some cases, older antipsychotic medicines to calm it down. But the problem with the older medicines is that they work by blocking dopamine. And we don't want to block dopamine in a condition that isn't enough dopamine. Nuplazid is a great medicine that is specifically indicated for Parkinson's disease psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, for Parkinson's. It does not impact dopamine at all. That's the beauty of it. It works on a, on, on a hormone called serotonin. Because it works on serotonin, though, it takes a good three to four weeks to kick in, but it works really well as a once daily medicine to treat hallucinations and psychosis and Parkinson's. And then this final one that we're going to talk about is a medicine called Nudexta. So there's a condition that goes along with Parkinson's called pseudobulbar affect, PBA. The symptoms are, and I kind of bill it as emotional incontinence, is this idea that the thermostat for emotion in the body is a little bit broke. And so people who have PBA or pseudobulbar affect tend to have fluctuations in emotional expression that's very different than their environment or how they feel. These are people who have uncontrollable laughing spells or crying spells, especially in Parkinson's, it's crying over not much of anything. So they're watching the news and they start crying, they're watching a movie, start crying, see their grandkids, they start crying, just start having emotional displays. And usually they say, I don't know why I'm crying. It's a condition and it's part of Parkinson's. The reason why we talk about it is because it's treatable. The medicine Nudexta is indicated to treat PBA and it makes for the majority of people who take it majority of people see full resolution of those symptoms, if not 70% better. So if you find that you're having crying spells or your emotional control is a little bit off, talk to your doctor about PBA, you might have it, and I can tell you that this works to really make it better. So remember I said up until eight years ago, this was our toolbox, right? And then I told a medical student about dan dirty dancing and putting baby in a corner and they didn't know what I was talking about. This is our toolbox today. Look at it, guys. We now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different categories of medicine and 23 medications overall. This takes having a partner who knows what to do. And so that's why I strongly suggest that everyone with Parkinson's find a good movement disorder specialty center to help drive your care. I know you like your general neurologist and they're probably fantastic. I know most of them. But just having one of us just take a look at things can help make sure that we're doing the right things for you and that we're using the tools we have to the best we can. Usually the general neurologists, a lot, I mean, love us. They're our friends. They love referring patients to us because we help. We're a team. It's all about having the right people on your team. And this hasn't even gone into technology. I hinted at it at the beginning. We have so many tools, so many beautiful tools that make people better. And don't forget deep brain stimulation, the ability to go to the source of the problem, to give consistent 24-hour adaptable therapy and back off on medicines by 60 or 80%. We have the Duopa pump that gives for 16 hours gel form levodopa where you take no medicine during the day. It just works. And focused ultrasound, which we're still figuring out where it fits in the realm of Parkinson's. My point is there's never a point where we can't say we have something we can do to try to make this better. And that takes us to the future, guys. The future is bright. Every year we get two or three new medicines that work better to do what we want to try to fix this. We have new inhibitors coming out, longer levodopa formulations. We have some really cool pump-based and subcutaneous delivery systems coming. DBS is getting better by the day. We're getting better technology. We're talking about targeted protein therapy, and we're even talking about cures. All of this equals hope. 
there's hope that we can do something and every year we get better things to do. But again, if the best that you're taking is a, is a medicine from the Nixon administration, then I promise you there are better tools out there to address why you can't do what you wanna do during the day. But it starts by having a very honest and very nice conversation with your doctor about the things that are holding you back so that we can come up with a plan on how to do it better. So that's all I got for you today. This was a wonderful Friday. I hope this was a very informative talk for you. I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my team. We are the Innova Parkinson's and Movement Center here in Northern Virginia. We span all through Northern Virginia. We have offices in Fairfax, Fair Oaks, Gainesville, and soon to be Loudoun. Um, and we do virtual clinic. We do telehealth all through the state of Virginia. We have, as of today, five movement disorder specialists. We're hiring our sixth. Um, we have Sonia Gao, who is a wonderful driver of our community content, many of which that we partner with APDA, but we run multiple um, educational and, and informative sessions every week. Um, we'd love to have you join us. Feel free to join our newsletter. Uh, if you do the QR code on your screen, it'll pull it up. Uh, you can always go to the website. That's Sonia's email address. That's as good as gold. If you need anything in the Northern Virginia area or even throughout Virginia, Sonia knows everybody. Email her, ask, she will give you more information than you thought you needed, and all of a sudden it will become easy. At the end of the day, we are all a community here. We are all part of the same team. Our collective role is to support one another, to push forward education and push forward the idea that you have to keep on fighting. You have to keep looking to that path and if it's working for you, and if it's not, have the courage to talk about a different path that might be better for you. So that's all I got for you. I am going to give a thumbs up, tell you a happy Friday, and answer some questions. How's that, everybody? It's Donna here from APDA. I just want to remind everybody out there that you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. OK, so somebody put in the question box. I think I heard somewhere that Ritari is expensive. Is that correct? So cost is an important point. Remember, all the drugs I just told you about are all name brand. Insurance companies don't want to pay for name brand medicine. They'd rather you take a medicine from the Nixon administration because it's cheap. Remember, cost is not truly a cost problem, though I get that it is. If there is a copay problem, that's an insurance coverage problem. For Ritari, for instance, I, I have probably 300 patients who take Ritari. Probably a good portion of them pay nothing for it. A good portion pay 10, 20 bucks a month. Some pay 40 bucks a month. Some people pay 200 a month. Some people we submit it and it's a thousand a month. We don't pay that, of course. If there is no cost, no consistent cost, then there isn't really cost, right? If I go to the pharmacy and pay cash for something, it's different depending on what pharmacy, depending on what insurance I have, depending on where I am during the year in terms of my deductible. Uh, donut hole versus catastrophic, it's insurance. And it's a nebulous, challenging world of frustration. What you need to do is pick the right thing for you, the thing that makes sense to hopefully get you better and do what we do in clinic. We send in the prescription because it's the only way to tell. And if it's good, we're good. If there's a coverage problem, you tell your pharmacist to hold it. You don't pay the thousand bucks. Then you let me know. And what we do is we sign you up for the program that the companies run to get you on that drug and to fight your insurance. They usually give you a case manager who fights, you, fights for you. They give you free medicines. They will set you up with foundational support. They do wonders for it. And we also call the insurance and see what we can do. And for most people, it goes from a thousand bucks a month to 40 bucks a month, all because we took that extra step of trying. So that's my advice. View cost as an insurance problem, not a cost problem, and fight it because better really does work better. Okay, that's a good question. Anybody else for questions? You can throw them in the Q&A or you can do it in the chat. Let's see what else we got here. Well, somebody asked, is the presentation going to be available to them? Uh, Donna, can you answer that one? I believe so. Absolutely. I, I was going to add that uh, in a later comment. This will be available at our website, APDA. Uh, <laughs> our APDA 
website, um, APDA Parkinson, you can see it here on this slide, .org slash VA. It will be posted there for you to watch um, and review uh, again in the future. Okay, and Sonia is reminding me that we did get some questions ahead of time. Let me pull that up. Sonia, if you could throw some of them in the chat, if you have them, I can just run through a couple. Um, so one of them we have, there we go, is, where is it? Um, what's the next, next big step for seeing impacting Parkinson's? I think the next biggest step is going to be um, subcutaneous pumps. So very much like an insulin pump where it's a little pump that gives a little subcutaneous delivery of levodopa all day and all night. It's already available. It just finished clinical studies. We're really excited to have it come to market here hopefully soon. That's the biggest one coming. Um, let's see here. Someone did say that it was a great talk. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Um, what's What will look, living with Parkinson's look like within the next five years? I will tell you that everybody is different. Um, if you take 10, uh, we have 50 people in the room, 50 people will be different in five years. It's all about treating you now, realizing that what happens tomorrow is tomorrow. I can't control tomorrow as much as I can control a year from now. So we got to treat you for today and just have, communicate and adapt as, thing, as time goes on. Um, someone mentioned freezing of gait. Uh, remember when your gait freezes, for some people it's medication responsive meaning you take your medicine, it gets better for a period. Sometimes the as needed medicines like the Kenmobi, uh, sub, the strip under the tongue works really well to make that better. But for some people, freezing of gait might be separate from medication. It's really important to talk to your bio doc about freezing of gait. And don't forget the role of physical therapy. Physical therapy is beautiful at addressing freezing of gait. Look at that. Let's see what else we got. We got a couple more. Uh, is there an average time frame one can anticipate seeing benefits from medicine? Yes, benefit uh, medicines work forever. It all depends on the strength of that medicine to fix the deficiency. <clears throat> this person's question was about Azelect and Requip. Now, Requip XL is a little bit of a tough drug. It doesn't really last for 24 hours. Um, Azelect or Resagiline boosts your natural dopamine. So on that regimen, you're not really adding anything into the tank to give dopamine back. So on that regimen, most people get a good three to four years out of it, but then you just add levodopa to it, and most people then do great. Um, someone asked about exercise in Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a wonderful, is made better by exercise. You all need to be exercising every day or every other day. I can only do so much with the chemicals and the tools I have. If you're not exercising and moving, there's a, it will only go so far. Okay, that's what I got, guys. Someone asked about a referral. We are actively seeing patients here in Northern Virginia. We have, again, four, soon to be five, soon to be, well, we have a hospital, so six movement docs. We take patients all the time. We're always happy to help get you on that better path. Well, with that, I will pass it back to Donna, give you all a giant thank you and a salute, and move towards the beautiful weekend. Thank you, APDA. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everybody. Well, Dr. Falconer, we give you a big thanks and a salute for a wonderful presentation today. And we also wanna thank everybody who participated in today's discussion. There was so much great information. And again, I wanna remind you, you can go to our website, apdaparkinson.org VA to, um, to view this presentation again. It was a lot of information and well worth taking another look. If you have an additional question or you'd like to speak to someone from our chapter, I encourage you to visit our website. I just told you that was apdaparkinson.org slash VA, or you can web go to our website. You can email us, call us. All the contact information is there. The next two presentations in the APD Virginia Educational Webinar Series will take place on January 28th with Dr. William Dal Dalrymple and February 25th with Dr. Michael Shapiro. These are two fantastic topics. You won't want to miss them. Registration is free, but it's required. So please go to our website to register. And remember to check out of the APDA Symptom Tracker. It'll help you and your loved ones track their symptoms. The symptom tracker is also available. Um, you can download it from the App Store or Google Play, and it's available in both English and Spanish. 
So with that, we will conclude on behalf of the entire APVA Virginia chapter, many, many thanks to Dr. Drew Falconer, the participants and our sponsors, Amneal Pharmaceuticals and Kiawa Kieran for supporting this program. If you know somebody who missed today's program, or if you joined late, just go to our website next week, it will be posted there and you can review it or, or watch it for the first time. Um, and please do share information about the existence of this. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful webinar. We encourage you to visit us at our website for more information about APDA and Parkinson's disease. Have a wonderful evening, happy holidays. We look forward to seeing you again in January. With that, we'll sign off. Bye.